Well, happy birthday, radio. Yes, today is the big one. Well, it's one of the big ones. It's one century since this. No. Well, all right, that's a reenactment, but that's what we do here. We don't have all of the clips. We do have some mighty audio from Dame Nellie Melba herself. Yes, the performer who launched radio to the masses. It's another two and a half years until the centenary of the BBC, but this is the 100th anniversary of professional public radio in this country. This is the British Broadcasting Century podcast, and this episode is arguably the British Broadcasting Centenary. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling... This is London College. Hello, welcome. I'm writer, comedian, occasional broadcaster, podcaster, other sorts of caster, caster sugar, I'm not quite sure. Paul Carenza here with party streamers, conical hat and a telegram from the Queen. Well, not all of those are true, but today is exactly 100 years since the Melba broadcast. Previously on this podcast... <laughs> We went from scientists to engineers, and then engineers to amateur entertainers, and now welcome the professionals to run a test of a different sort. We've had transmission tests, but this is to see if there's an audience interested in the shows. It's not that dissimilar in a way from this podcast, I suppose, so thanks for giving us a try, and do get in touch. Just like those early engineers requesting feedback, I would welcome yours. Find us on Twitter at BB Century. <laughs> Thank you, too, if you've rated and reviewed this podcast. Uh, those who have have been incredibly kind. It really, really helps others find it. There's this odd algorithmic, if that's a word, quirk, where podcast providers kind of help promote podcasts sometimes. If people do rate review, these first few weeks are crucial. After the next couple of weeks, we can settle down into more of a groove and we'll have episodes each week rather than every few days as it's been till now. So this episode begins a relationship that hugely affects today's world. That's the press and the media. And not just the press, in fact, in this episode, British broadcasting is propelled forward by an unlikely ally, the Daily Mail. Now, if you're not aware, the Daily Mail and the BBC are not necessarily the best of friends all of the time. And we are going back 100 years ago to the day, to one of broadcasting's most crucial landmark moments. This is the first professional funded planned public broadcast featuring the world's premier singer and she's the only opera singer i know to have a peach dessert named after her and indeed some toast she also helped launch british radio so on this episode we will hear from her we will give dame nelly melba back her voice and if you think you can guess how it all pans out you are in for a surprise there will be unparalleled success but there will also be such failure that it all ends in silence but first Noise! So, we left our intrepid crew of Marconi engineers in Chelmsford in early 1920, testing transmissions and shock horror, having a bit of fun with it. Train timetables became news and songs, so now the Daily Mail has got wind of it all, and Lord Northcliffe, the Mail's owner, he loves a fad, so he wants in on radio. In fact, he wants his own Daily Mail radio station. Now, notice that Times Radio is just starting right now. Newspapers trying to launch radio stations. It's like we planned it and everything. So the Mail invite the singing world's biggest star, Dame Nellie Melba, fresh from a run at the Royal Albert Hall. The engineers will surely go there or to the Royal Opera House or somewhere else that she feels at home. But no, the size of transmitter means that radio is not portable. There is no such thing as an outside broadcast at this stage. There is currently no named thing, in fact, as a broadcast, let alone outside. And so the Chelmsford Opera House it is, in other words, a room at the Marconi factory with a lick of paint. Now, Madame Melba, she is reluctant at first, not because of the location so much, but she has no intention of being an experiment. But she agrees for a thousand pounds. That's enough to buy a house back in 1920. It's all paid for by Lord Northcliffe and the Daily Mail. The earlier concerts, Mr White's band, they were advertised by an internal memo saying what would be on and when. They were the first listings. But now the mail is behind the much-anticipated Melba concert. These words, in fact, this is from the Daily Mail itself on the day of the concerts. This is a hundred years ago to the day as this episode lands with you. At a quarter past seven this evening, a great singer will hail the world by a long trill into space. Thousands of people on land and at sea are eagerly looking forward to hearing the glorious voice of the Australian Nightingale, 
Dame Nellie Melba swelling through space into their instruments. Art, romance and science are all combined in the experiment. Now, whereas before it was radio hams only, now people are actively buying or indeed making radio sets and they're applying for licences. 600 applications to the post office in the weeks leading up to this performance. Still, that's not a majority of people listening, but it's British Broadcasting's biggest boost. Meanwhile, in the Chelmsford Works, Ditcham and Round, our engineering double act, are preparing the executive dining room for the makeshift studio. It's the only room suitable for a star of Melba's calibre. Here's the pippy early radio voice to tell us more. Well, as they're setting up in the dining room, there are some cables and there's an electrical test and a small fire. So the dining room is no longer a suitable place for a concert, now that the floor's on fire. The transmitter is part gutted, part cooked, you could say, which ironically is exactly how Dame Melba has asked for her chicken to be prepared. Yes, a half-cooked chicken with champagne is to be consumed before the performance. And have it she will. Chin chin. Thankfully, the fire occurs without Melba there. Otherwise, it would be, wait for it, Melba toast. And yes, Melba Toast was indeed named after her, and Peach Melba too. Fancy having a dessert named after you? Well, just ask my friend, Dave Yogurt. On the day itself, here she comes. The Grand Dame is accompanied by her family and her accompanists. They're very good at accompanying her accompanists. And her official escort is Mr Arthur Burroughs, Marconi's head of publicity. Pay attention to him. More on Burroughs to come. Lord Northcliffe, head of the mail, he's there too. And look, there's Godfrey Isaacs, the Marconi boss. No Marconi as such. He's on his boat off the Italian coast. There's a small crowd here, including Winifred Sayer, now, who's she? Ah, oh, yes, ten points if you recall that she was British Broadcasting's first professional artiste a few months and one episode ago. She's rather put out by the event. Melba's a tad brusque with her. Oh, and indeed Melba's being paid enough to buy a house, while Sayer only got 30 shillings. Plus, to hear it live is not quite the same as Winifred Sayer wished to hear it on the magic of the radio. The studio is not quite ready, and so Arthur Burroughs covers by giving Melba a tour of the works. And what a conversation they have on viewing the giant 450-foot twin masts. Burroughs says, soon your voice will be sent across the world from the top of that mast. And Melba replies, young man, if you think I'm going to climb up there, you are greatly mistaken. Now it's time for Melba to eat that part-cooked chicken in the Chelmsford Works executive dining room, probably still smelling of burnt carpet, before being taken to the new studio. It's an old storage shed around the back, with makeshift carpet and curtains just to make it look nice. It's all a bit ramshackle. Even the microphone for best acoustics is in fact fashioned from an old wooden cigar box attached to the mouthpiece of Ditcham's candlestick telephone, all hung from a bit of elastic attached to a hat rack. Before showtime, it's just enough time for one more hilarious slash dangerous misunderstanding. While Melba poses for photos in front of the transmitter, one eager engineer is charged with looking out for any exploding or burning out of valves. So when a photographer's flashbulb innocently goes off, the engineer panics and shuts down everything just before they're about to go on air. Whoops. And then it's showtime. <laughs> So, when it all fires up again at 7.15pm on June the 15th, 1920, the nation, the world even, or at least those with radios who've remembered, listen in as Melba is introduced. And then, standing a yard from the weird cigar box hat rack microphone, 100 years ago today, Melba trills. Hello. Her hello to the world, as she calls it. And then, her opening song. Home Sweet Home, sounding rather like this. Now that version is from a year earlier, 1919, but it's the same singer, the same song, with piano accompaniment blasting out of radio sets across the world. Britain's got talent? You bet she has. Except, like, the modern-day talent shows we've borrowed from overseas to get, you know, the best. Dear Nelly Melba, you're going through to boot camp. 
Yeah, I know, my ant sounded more like deck and my deck sounded more like ant. But you get the idea. This was the precursor of all modern talent shows, indeed the precursor of all broadcasting. Now, you may have noticed I have been hiding, pastiching, referencing, just downright spoofing other TV and radio shows from the last hundred years in these podcasts. It's a nice little challenge for myself. All shows that wouldn't be here without these first baby steps of broadcasting. In episode one, we had Pick of the Pops. Episode two, I think Record Breakers, we vaguely channeled. Episode three, uh, later with Jules Holland. So episode four, I wondered, what modern spin do we take to the Melba concert? Well, it's got to be big budget, big audience entertainment, shiny floor. Although Melba's floor wasn't exactly shiny. In fact, she kicked the carpet away, saying it would absorb the sound. So just before the broadcast, the carpet and curtains were quickly removed, leaving a rather patchy factory floor underneath. So what do we go for? Strictly come broadcasting? Do we uh, spoof this as the M factor? Chelmsford's got talent. Now, I know that's ITV, but all TV and radio in Britain comes from this moment. It's not just the BBC. So no, I'm going for The Voice. It may not be the biggest example of the talent show format, but that idea of chairs turning if they like what they hear, well, that is this, isn't it? You know, the country, the continent, in fact, and beyond are hearing Melba, hearing British radio for the first time. Melba's 30-minute concert reaches far and wide. There are ships operators at sea, the best place for ships operators, I guess. There's Rome, Berlin, Madrid hears it. There's London, of course, where Melba's assistant, who's listening at the Daily Mail office, nearly falls off her chair in shock at hearing her boss's familiar voice 60 miles away. It truly is quite magical. Like the voice, chairs face the broadcast voice for the first time. Now, some, like Lord Northcliffe of the Mail, have front row, suited and booted seats. But radio is, for the first and not the last time, a great unifier. You've got Morse code operators at sea, from as far as Newfoundland to the west and Persia to the east. Families of all shapes and sizes can attend this night at the opera, huddled around their radio sets. Now, flash forward three years and the first Christmas issue, the first colour, Radio Times, has on its cover what? It's a family with their backs to the fire, facing the new radio set. So like TV later, that picture shows that families are literally turning their chairs away from the fire and towards the voice in this box. Tenuous connection to modern day programming done, but the point stands. The world sits and their chairs are now facing the voice. And the winner is... Radio! Now, I know Ant and Deck don't present the voice, but as we know, that doesn't sound anything like Ant and Deck, so it's fine. Look, I can't do impressions. I do amateur history, all right? Oh, and it's worth adding that almost all who are listening at home are listening via headphones. Almost all radio at this point was received by sets with what we think of as headphones, but what they actually called earphones. They were over the head, though. So in many cases, these headphones are passed around to hear Melba sing in English and in French. So that's Nymph et Sylvain by Benberg. No, no, me neither. Benberg is her accompanist, in fact, there on the day, so keeps him happy, surely. And France are happy generally. The signal is so good in Paris, the Eiffel Tower station print a record of the concert. More famously, there's Adio from Puccini's La Boheme. And then, towards the end of the concert, the transmitter breaks. Off air. Ditch them and round the engineering duo, the ant and deck of their day, watch in horror as the valves fail in front of their eyes, in front of Lord Northcliffe, in front of the Marconi boss, and of course, before all of the ears of the world. Ditchum fixes it, but not in time to catch Melba's last song. So here is a challenge. What do you do? Have a think about this. Put yourself in Ditcham and Round's shoes. The concert has just ended abruptly early with no transmission going out. So how do you save the day? Do you A, let the hundreds of thousands of listeners go without the end of the concert and they just assume that their radios were at fault? Or do you B, resign and then run into the streets of Chelmsford to the nearest Weatherspoons? Or C, step into the studio and tell the world's most famous and probably most terrifying opera singer that that last song didn't go out, so can she do it again? Or D, step into the studio and tell the world's most famous and most terrifying opera singer Madam Melba, the world is calling for more. Encore! Yes, it's D. Captain Round rushes in and says those very words. And Melba replies... Are they? Shall I go on singing? For the love of everything, yes.
Now Ditcham's fixed it, she sings an encore, and she concludes with God Save the King. Dame Nellie Melba, reticent to begin with, calls it the most wonderful experience of my career. So in a mo, what follows Melba? Well, how do you follow that? Well, we follow it right now with another broadcasting memory from you. Email me with yours, paul at paulcarenza.com. Don't be shy, we would love to hear from you. A minute or so of your name, where you're from, and those heartstring-tugging, character-forming, rose-tinted memories of broadcasting's yesteryear. Here's Lorna Farrell with hers. My name is Lorna Farrell, and I'm from Glasgow in Scotland. I absolutely used to love this TV programme called Hector's House, which were little puppets named Hector, Zsa Zsa and Kiki. I think it was originally French. I remember as well Watch With Mother, which had things like Bill and Ben and Trumpton. Um, Oh, they were just so good. I also remember actually one of the most exciting days was coming home from school and we had got our first colour television and it just seemed like everything was transformed. Radio wise, without doubt, my happiest radio memories were Sunday evenings sitting with my cassette recorder and taping the Top 40 show. Um, Everybody did it and you went into school the next day discussing whether or not you liked the new number one. Uh, That was always a must do every Sunday evening. Thank you, Lorna. Uh, She's a writer, a Christian speaker, and you can find her Facebook page with prayers and poetry. It's called Lorna's Little Corner. First colour telly, eh? Well, that's a way off here. We're not even on the first colour radio. And children's programming, that's going to come a while away yet, but it's from next week's guest, Arthur Burroughs. Now, not only does Burroughs bring us the children's hour eventually at the BBC, but this future BBC director of programming appears in our story now. He is the one to back announce Dame Nelly Melba. Yet it's not William Ditcham. He was the usual announcer, of course, the voice of Chelmsford, but Arthur Burroughs, now the Marconi publicity boss, he is the one who closes the night by saying, Hello, hello. We hope you have enjoyed hearing Melba sing. Good night. Yes, he ended by saying hello. Clearly, they've not quite cottoned on to hello being a greeting at the start of a broadcast, with goodbye being more appropriate for the end of a broadcast. And a goodbye-ish hello from Burroughs is in fact rather ironic, because this is pretty much Arthur Burroughs's hello to the radio presenting world as he says goodbye to Ditcham. He is slightly pushing out Ditcham, who's now busy fixing valves, of course. This is the passing on of the baton from engineers to marketeers. Which is why next episode, after this birthday bonanza, it's all about Burroughs, the publicity boss. He will take it from here. Remember, Ditcham and Round are the two that got away. They return to their engineering roots to let radio fly. And they will pop back as a cameo later, I'm sure. Now, we've got more centenaries ahead. But after Melba's, the next major centenaries aren't actually for about 18 months. As we'll see next episode, the next year and a half fall rather quiet. It's February 2022 that we have to wait until radio's next big 100th birthday, when the first regular radio programme, finally called a broadcast, comes in. And later, in 2022, November, that's the centenary of the BBC itself. And that's what we're working towards in this series of 12 or so episodes. As for this century-old Melba concert, it is a test, all right, and a successful one at that. The quality, distance, the response is overwhelmingly positive. The Daily Mail writes the next day, Art and science joined hands, and the world listening in must have counted every minute of it precious. Thank you so much for subscribing and listening to the podcast and rating and reviewing if you're able to as well. Whatever you're doing to help get it out there. I am literally a one-man band, except without the band part. There's no one else but me here. I should repeat, this podcast is unaffiliated with the BBC. They've not asked for it, commissioned it or otherwise. It's just me in a wardrobe surrounded by trousers. Apparently that gives you the best acoustics. So someone told me. So there are ways you can support the podcast and give me a hand. If you are willing and able, there's patreon.com slash Paul Carenza for regular monthlies of any level with all benefits and patron-only goodies and things like that. 
Or there's coffee.com slash Paul Carenza. That's ko-fi.com slash Paul Carenza for tips for coffee kind of thing. It all helps keep the podcast going. Web hosting, equipment, it all costs a bit of cash. And equally, you're welcome to enjoy for free and just be part of our community. Facebook.com slash BB Century. There are loads of beautiful old images, audio and video from broadcasting's early moments for you to like and share. And if you would like and share, that's always a marvellous thing. I appreciate every one. Your questions, comments, memories and general historical geeking out are indeed all welcome. Paul at paulcarenza.com to send me anything you like. Next time we're zooming in on Arthur Burroughs as he takes it from here and we'll find out how the response from Melba didn't quite leave to all the glory they would have liked and how in fact radio got cancelled. But right now it's a birthday so let's blow out some candles. Happy birthday, radio. Why not give your radio set the bumps today? Just a hundred, I'm sure it wouldn't harm it too much. And do join me next time on the British Broadcasting Century. Presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. With fantastic original music by Will Farmer. Archive clips are in the public domain, being as old as they are. But if you disagree and own any clips, do let us know and we will grovel and humbly take them down. We're very sorry. Stay informed, educated and entertained. And join us next time on the British Broadcasting Century. (laughs) 